Today, what I entitled my sermon is Spiritual Supplements. Spiritual Supplements. You're going to write this down and, and write where we'll be. We'll be in 2 Peter chapter 1 today. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And these are huge verses. This, uh, this week, as I was uh, subbing, substitute teaching, I was reading and, and thinking about where I was going. And, and I had this question in my mind that I really wanted to get across. The question in my mind was, how do we have fruitful ministry? And what keeps us from having a fruitful ministry? Or what things will make our ministry unfruitful? And what I mean by fruitful ministry is this idea of, I want people to come to know Jesus, and I want people to grow closer to Jesus who already do know Him. I'm not talking about fruitful ministry as in a building or money or fighting. I'm not talking about fruitful ministry in the world's eyes. I'm talking about it in God's eyes. Amen? I don't care about anything else except leading people to Jesus Christ and people who already know Him to grow closer to Him. So, we're talking about fruitful ministry. My question was, how do we have a fruitful ministry and what keeps us from having a fruitful ministry? And in your life, you don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to think individually right now. Do I want to have a fruitful ministry? In my life and as a church, this goes for all of us. How do we have a fruitful ministry as Revive, as this church? And I found some great verses on it that say exactly what we need to do. So if you're taking notes, please take all these notes today. This is an unbelievable uh, just passage of Scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1. But I call this sermon spiritual supplements because the idea of a supplement is to enhance something that already exists. That's what supplement means. It enhances something. And the first thing I think about is nutrition and working out. Right? Anybody out there taking supplements when you work out or in your nutrition? Anybody take a vitamin right now? Right? That's a supplement. Now, I remember when one of my friends moved in from Seattle. He moved into my house before I got married. And I was a bachelor, so my house didn't look like it does now. <laughs> didn't have curtains up, you know. Wasn't painting on the walls, wood paneling. We just, I mean, it was a bachelor pad. I mean, I didn't, you know. But one thing it did have was still had a bunch of books because I like to read. Uh, but before that, uh, Trevor moved down here from Seattle and... Uh, we had a pool table in the house, you know, we did have a kitchen table, we took it out and we put a weight bench in there. Like, why, what do two dudes need a kitchen table for? Are we going to sit around and have family dinner? No, we're going to eat at the couch, watch the TV, and then we're going to go work out. So we, uh, we had a weight bench in the kitchen, or not in the kitchen, in the dining room of the house. And we were working out all the time. Uh, we were working out constantly, and DJ was working out with us as well. Uh, when he lived there, you know, three dudes working out. It was, a, it was, it was fun for the time. Uh, now two of us are married, and Trevor is getting married next year. So things change. But we were, uh, we were working out all the time. And one of the things that I was doing constantly was working out and taking a supplement. Multiple supplements, actually. And I don't know anybody who works out who doesn't really take a supplement. Whether it's a vitamin, whether it's whey protein, whether it's pre-workout. Right? When people work out, they normally are taking a supplement. So when we, uh, when we were working out, I used to take uh, whey protein. Can you tell? I still take it? No, I'm just joking. I don't. Uh, but I, I, I don't persevere long enough when I work out. I work out for like a month, and then I'll take a month off, work out again, you know, taste that stuff. you got to persevere when you're doing this stuff. But whey protein was something we used to drink protein shakes after we worked out. But we would also take this supplement called C4 before we worked out. Right? Trevor brought this thing, C4, home. And this, I do not recommend anybody to take this stuff. Because some supplements are good for you, right? Some supplements are not so good for you. For instance, you have you know, the vitamins that you take, they could be good for you. But then you have steroids. Are those good for you? No. Still supplements. So we were taking this C4, this pre-workout, and it's supposed to get you jacked up to work out. You're supposed to be ready and excited and, I mean, just get your blood flowing so you can work out and lift. Well, Trevor took a couple scoops of C4, and I'm like, I've never taken any pre-workout before. Give me a scoop of that. And I, and I drank that, and I'm not kidding. Like, two minutes later, my skin is hot, and I am itching like this. It's 
all over my body. I'm like, I shouldn't, I'm not taking that again. But I mean, there it got to the point where you're just, this supplement is just not good for you. And I don't, I don't think I should be itching my skin like this all day. But I was ready to work out, you know? That supplement got me ready to work out. Well, the idea with nutrition is the same idea that Peter talks about in 2 Peter. This idea of enhancing your diet and nutrition is the same thing kind of Peter is talking about. And instead of your diet and spirituality, it's your faith. The belief that you have in your heart about who Jesus Christ is, who God is. That faith in Jesus Christ is your diet. But there are things that you need to add to your faith in order to have a fruitful ministry. Your faith is what saves you, amen? Thank God, right? Thank God we're not saved based on how good we are. Because I wouldn't get there, nobody would get there. That's what the cornerstone song when it says, His righteousness is given to you. The idea is none of us are righteous, we're all evil. But Jesus lived a perfect life and He died on the cross and His righteousness is given to us so that we can get to heaven one day and spend time with God and be in relationship with God. Amen? That's what the idea is. And that all happens by faith in Jesus. So faith is the foundation. Faith is your, your diet. But supplements needed to, need to be added to your faith in order to produce fruit. If you want your life to be productive, to have meaning, and you want to see people saved and see people grow closer to Jesus, you need to add these things to your faith. And that's what we're going to look at today. Spiritual supplements. First requirement is you must have faith. If you do not know Jesus Christ, these things don't mean anything, really. These are supplemented, added, enhanced. They enhance your faith. Let's look at these verses. First, or 2 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 3. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. I want to tell you today, God has given you everything you need in this world to have a life that is godly. I love verse 3. He says, everything that you need has been made available to you by God so that you can live a godly life. Amen? If you don't believe that, I don't know what you believe. Because Jesus Christ was given to us so that we can live a godly life. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of all believers was given to you so that you can live a godly life. So you can live a holy and a righteous life for, for Christ. God has given us everything we need to live the life that we want to live for Him. He's granted it all to us. Amen. Verse 4, By which He has granted to us in His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. It says God has, given, has great promises for us. And because of these promises... <laughs> So that through these promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature. It doesn't mean you become like God or you become a God. What it means is you, you become like God in this life. What I mean by that is, you're not, you're, not like, you're not a God. What you are is you're like Christ. When you're a Christian, you should be getting closer to the image of Christ. Amen? That's the whole idea of being a Christian. Christian means Christ follower. So it means in my life, if, if I'm progressing as a Christian, I should look more and more like Christ. That is what Peter's saying. In your life, you, if you're growing in your faith and you're using these six things, these spiritual supplements, you should grow to act and be and look more like Christ and you should be more godly. Amen? That's what these things are about. And if we are more like Christ, then our ministry is going to be fruitful, amen, right? It's going to be fruitful. It's going to have purpose. It's going to have meaning. Look at what he says in verse 5. And this is where we get into, and this is really what I want to spend my time, on all the supplements that you need to add to your faith. All the supplements you need to add to your faith. He says this, For this very reason, make every effort, effort to supplement that's the word here that we're going to focus on. Enhance is what that means. To supplement 
your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Those are the, those are the things. For if these qualities, and this is the reason, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Verse 8 is a, great, is a warning for us. It's a warning that if you don't add these things to your faith, your ministry will not be fruitful. But it's also an encouragement to us. If you do add these to your faith, guess what? Your ministry is going to produce fruit, right? And I don't know about you, but I want my life to be fruit bearing. I want my life, I want to see people saved and see people come to know Jesus better. Amen? I want Revive as a church to bear so much fruit that people say, God has to be working there, right? I want so many people to be saved through this church that people say God's got to be doing something. Because it ain't how good Josh preaches. And that's true. Right? It's not, you say amen to that. It ain't how it ain't good how good Josh preaches because he don't preach that good. It's about God is doing something. Amen? Amen. amen. That's right. I don't preach that good, but God is doing something here. All right? God is doing something. I want people to be able to look at that and be able to say, people are being saved not because they're great, but because God is great in them. That's the point of the Scripture. We have faith in Christ. If we add these things, we are going to be fruitful as a church and as an individual. And look at these things that Peter says. He says, virtue... Right? You've got to have faith, but then you add virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, brotherly affection, and love. And we're going to look at what each one of these words mean, because sometimes when you read through the Bible, you're like, I don't quite know what that word means. I have an idea of it, and when I was reading through there, virtue is one of those, I'm like, I have an idea of what virtue means, but I don't know fully what it means. Virtue equals excellence. And if we as Christians want our ministry, want our lives to be fruitful, then we must live our life excellent. Amen? We must live an excellent life. We must do everything to the best of our ability. So many times we go through life and we do things halfway and we wonder why they don't work. When God is saying, if you do it, to 100% to the best of your abilities. To the best of your spiritual gifts that I have given you as well. I will be in it and I will receive the glory through it. Amen? The church needs to be a place where excellence is demanded. Excellence. I believe what Peter's talking about, I believe he's talking about excellence in every asset of your life. Everything you do. When you go to work, you do it excellently. When you spend time reading your word, you don't do it halfway, you do it excellently. You really study it. When you, whatever you do, whatever you do in the church, if you're serving behind the coffee bar, you do it excellently. Amen? If you're greeting people at the door, you do it excellently. If you're preaching sermons, you better do them excellently. You better not come up here not preparing yourself and not ready to what you're going to say because you can say a bunch of false stuff. If you want to preach, you better do it excellently. If you want to be a leader, you better be a leader excellently. Amen? That is what God is calling to us. That's what virtue means. It means in every asset. But it especially means in your moral life. And it's funny that we honored, we brought our elders up before the church because one of the uh, qualities that must be in an elder is this right here. Listen to this. The quality, the characteristic, must have an elder. Qualification is that people outside the church must look at you and respect you well. 
They must look at you well. It doesn't mean they agree with Jesus Christ as God and He died on the cross for my sins. It doesn't mean they agree with your stance on the Bible is 100% true. It doesn't mean they agree with your stance on homosexuality. It doesn't mean they agree with your stance on gun control. But what it does mean is they look at you and they say, that is a good man. I don't believe everything he believes, but he lives as if he believes it. Amen? He lives a good life. Now, good works don't get us to heaven, amen? Only faith gets us there. But if we want people to come to know Christ, we can't be living in a way contrary to Christ. We must live excellently. It doesn't mean you're not forgiven of your sins. It doesn't mean that you still won't sin. But the idea is you're trying not to sin, amen? You're living a life of excellence. That's why those elders have a lot of Stuff on their plate. Because if, you, if you're an elder in a church or if you're a pastor, if, if you do something morally wrong, it looks bad on all Christians. Amen? It does. You can read story after story after story of people who said they were Christians and they did something wrong and they are bashed. Doesn't mean they're not sinners, but what I am saying is we need to watch how we live our life. And Peter is saying that too with virtue. Live your life excellently, amen? Do your ministry excellently. Excellence in your morality does not help you in getting to heaven, but it does help reaching the world for Jesus Christ. No doubt about it. Second word that he says, so you got faith, then you add virtue, you add excellence, now you add knowledge. And knowledge is knowledge. No trick here. Knowledge means Knowledge. And the idea, this, this is self-explanatory, but faith is the idea of believing in your heart, amen? To believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord. That He died on the cross for your sins. To believe it in your heart. Knowledge is to believe it in your mind. But I believe they both help each other, amen? They both help each other. A lot of times as Christians we look down upon knowledge. But Peter says, I want you to add knowledge to your faith. Because if you have faith and then you add something that you learn about Jesus Christ, guess what your faith does? Increases. That's why I want to have this Bible study tonight at 6 o'clock on the birth, of, birth prophecies of Jesus Christ. Because once we understand, we have the knowledge of what the Old Testament says about how the Messiah will come, and then we compare it to what happens with Jesus Christ, it should increase your faith to know this is 100% true. And if you don't know any of those prophecies, come out tonight. But the knowledge should increase your faith. Help your faith. Aid your faith. Some people have head knowledge and no heart knowledge. Absolutely. But I believe many times head knowledge of Jesus Christ turns into believing in your heart. So we should be learning more about Christ. Learning more about God. Knowledge needs to be added to your faith. The third one is self-control. And what self-control means is mastery. It means mastery. Mastery, most importantly, this is very similar to morality, but mastery, most importantly, of your desires or of your physical Body. To be able to master lust. To be able to master when temptation comes. To be able to master against it. To be able to say, I don't care when the temptation comes. I'm not going to do it. I can control my body. Amen? Christians need to get to the place where they can control. That's what self-control means. It means mastery. And most Likely, what Peter is talking about is sensual appetites or your physical appetites. And I would include in there things like lust, anger. I would include in there hunger. Now that, that's not morality. Hunger, not necessarily morality, per se. But when you fast for the Lord, you better have some self-control, right? When you fast for the Lord, you better be able to tell your stomach, No. We don't do that enough as Christians, amen? 
I joke about being a glutton on Thanksgiving, but we as Christians in America are gluttons almost every day. We need to be able to say no to our stomachs and yes to God. What Peter's talking about is mastery of your physical appetites. Because lust is going to come for all of us, but can you master it? Hunger is going to come when you're fasting or when you're already full and you shouldn't eat no more. Can you master it? Anger is going to come in your life. Can you master it? Outwardly, can you master it? You may be really angry inside, but can you master it? Pride, can you master it? Peter's saying if you can master it, it will enhance your faith and your ministry will be more fruitful. No doubt about it. There's no question this, this self-control idea needs to be one that we all focus on. All focus on that one. We can all do better in that area, especially myself. I'm speaking for me. The fourth thing he adds is steadfastness. How many times we don't know what steadfastness means? All it means is to persevere. This ability for you to never give up and to continue on. That needs to be added to your faith. You need to believe in Jesus Christ, but not only that, when bad times come, you need to persevere. Amen? You need to persevere. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 8, verse 15. He says, at, he's talking about the good soil. You know the parable of all the soils, right? Good soil, bad soil. I mean, you know rocky soil. <laughs> Luke 8, 15, he says, As for that and the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with what? Patience. Patience and steadfastness. And perseverance. All the same thing. The good soil in the parable is the one who perseveres. And this is a huge key in ministry. How long can you persevere and keep going if God has really called you to it? If you know it for a fact, there are some things we do on our own, no doubt about it. But if God has really called you to it, how well can you persevere? I remember when God called me to youth ministry, I started out in youth group with three kids, five kids, somewhere around there. Three to five kids. For at least six months to a year, I had three to five kids every week. You know how many times I've thought about giving up? Like, this is not worth it. Three to five kids, what am I doing? This is almost pointless. Anybody ever had that feeling before? If God has called you to it, you need to persevere. Because through all kinds of different events... Kids started to come. And more kids started to come. And at the beginning I'm wondering, God, I haven't even baptized a kid yet. I haven't even led a kid to Jesus Christ yet. What is going on? And then more kids started to come. And I began to see some of those kids come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, right? If I had given up, none of them would have came to know Him. Not at least through that youth ministry. I'm going to tell you, perseverance in your ministry. If you know God has called you to it, continue. <coughs> and continue. And continue. Amen? Add that perseverance, that steadfastness to your faith. When you do it, you're going to see God come through for you. The last three here. The fifth one he adds, brother, or godliness. Yes, adds godliness. And what godliness means is piety or awe. And what I mean by that is, many times in the Bible we use the word fear and it doesn't mean like, I'm scared to death. What it means is, I'm in awe of who God is. I'm like, wow, at who God is. That's true in this word. Godliness doesn't, it, it means you're in awe of who God is. You have reverence toward Him. You have awe. Oh, you're humble. You're humble and He is God. It's awe. Oh, it's reverence towards God. This is the act of being devoted to God because He is God. Amen? Being devoted to God because He is God. 
So many times we're devoted, we're halfway devoted to God for God and we're halfway devoted to God for ourselves. What this is, is I'm devoted for God. I'm in awe of God because of who He is. Nothing to do with me, amen? Nothing to do with what I get in return. It's all about Him. Fifth thing, the next thing, brotherly affection. This is pretty self-explanatory too. The love of fellow brothers or fellow believers or of other believers. The Bible tells us that we need to love our other believers. Amen? We need to... I, I remember Paul, he says it... I believe it's Paul. He says, take care of the household of faith. Take care of the household of faith. You need to love your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And you need to be there for them. And this will enhance your ministry. This will grow your faith. This will produce fruit if you love your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So many times we love outside people, people outside the church too much. Some churches do that great. They love people outside the church, but they don't do enough for people in. Some people do it the other way. They love people inside too much, and they don't love people outside the church enough. Both have to happen, amen? Both have to happen in the church. I have to love people outside the church who aren't Christians, and I have to love people who are inside the church who are. And look at the last one. Love. This is the love of all people. The love of every human being that has ever walked the face of the planet. I don't care who they are or where they come from or where they grew up or what they have done. It doesn't matter. We want a fruitful ministry. We must love all people. Amen? We must love all people, not some. All people. This is so important for us because I think everybody in this room who is a Christian right now would say, I want my life to have meaning and I want to see God glorified and I want to bear fruit. If you're a Christian and you don't say that, I have to wonder whether you're a Christian, kind of. Because the whole point of, of knowing Christ is to lead others to Christ too. One of the points of knowing Christ If you want to bear fruit, you must add these six things to your faith. Amen? You saw the, the, the consequences if we do not add them to our faith. Look at this. Go back to those verses in the second uh, slide. Verse 8. Verse 8, he says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective. Verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The whole point, what Peter is saying, is you need to add these things into your life. Add these to your faith. I thought about bringing a protein shake up here, uh, a prop like Pastor Earl, but I didn't. I thought about bringing a prop up here and saying, this is your faith. You need to add these things and make it my own protein shake up here. Like I used to do. The idea is your faith. You have faith. Now add these things to it and watch what happens when you do. Amen? It's huge for us. If we want God to be the God of this city right here, Williamstown, Kentucky, we want God to be the God of Grant County, if we want fruit to happen in this church, we want to see people saved and see people grow closer to Jesus Christ, we have got to add these things to our faith. If we don't, Peter says, you'll have an unfruitful ministry in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we do, he says, you will be effective. Amen? I want to be effective. I want Revive to be effective in reaching people and in growing Christians in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like I said earlier, I'm not worried about how awesome of a building we have as a church. I'm not worried about how much we have in savings. I'm not worried, doesn't mean we don't plan, but I'm not worried about the physical things of this world. What we are worried about bearing fruit is leading people to Jesus and growing those who already do know Jesus. And we have to have these six things in our life added to our faith in order to be really, really fruitful. So what I want you to do 
write those six things down, go, all, go home and look those six things up in 2 Peter chapter 1, and really take a deep look at yourself and say, what am I not doing well? What is not increasing, as verse 8 says? What is not increasing in my life? And if it's not increasing, if I'm not growing in that area, then I need to be. I need to change something and do something in that area. And when I do, I will start to see my life be more productive for the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not only am I asking you to do it, I'm asking me to do it. I need to do this. And I will tell you, in my life, there's one area that I can look at right now and I can say, I need to be able to control my body better. Self-control. What I mean by that is I need to be able to fast better and more often. I need to be able to control just physical stuff in my life. Maybe it'll say, I can go without that. I can go with, without food for a day and spend time with God. That's me. I don't know about you. You may do that great, but you may not be growing in your knowledge. And you need to do that more. Because all these things work together to build your faith and build your ministry and, and have it fruitful. All of them work together.